So last Sunday we, <clears throat> we began a, a series on spiritual warfare called Fight the Good Fight. And I want to start our time today by just sharing this, that the, the topic, the concept of, of spiritual warfare is an uncomfortable theme in many circles. In liberal denominations across America, they have actually taken the militant hymns out of their songbooks. You, you won't find a song like Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus or Soldiers of Christ Arise in their hymnals anymore. And they say that that kind of vocabulary is inappropriate for the Christian message. Well, where did that kind of language come from? It came right out of the Bible. One of the most popular metaphors to describe the Christian life is to describe the Christian life as a battle and to describe us as soldiers and to say that we are in a war. Songwriters didn't just get hyper one day and dream up that kind of language. They borrowed that language straight from Scripture. There are other metaphors in Scripture to talk about Christians. Sometimes our life is described as a walk or a pilgrimage. Sometimes we are compared to plants or seeds. But one of the most common metaphors in, in all of the Bible is for us to be described as soldiers, that we are in an army, and that we are at war. Now, having said that, it really interested me when I learned about a decision by the Swedish government in an effort to balance their budget and pay off bills, they decided to cut back the operations of the Swedish army. This is legit. This is not a makeup thing that preachers sometimes say in the pulpit. This really happened. They only operate from 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. And I guess that's a great plan as long as your enemies don't work nights and weekends. That same thing happened to us in our country way back in our beginnings. The Continental Congress wanted to pass an amendment saying that the army of this new country could only have 5,000 men in it. Well, they went and asked General George Washington what he thought about that. And he said, well, that's fine as long as you pass a law that say we can only be invaded by an army of 3,000. If you are going to be in a war, you better know something about the nature and the size and the aggressiveness and the tendencies of your enemy. And you better know that our enemy never takes nights and weekends off. There's never a holiday. There is never a, a truce in spiritual warfare. We are on duty at all times not just when it's convenient. This scripture was read at the beginning of our worship service, 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Apostle Paul writes to the young minister, Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Now, it's very obvious that Paul is saying that Christians are like soldiers and Jesus is our commanding officer. And a good soldier can't let his life get distracted or he will compromise his mission. So that's why we actually take time to study spiritual warfare so that we won't get distracted and prove unpleasing to our commanding officer. And today, what I want to do is just give you some basic training about the dark side. What is our enemy like? What is the nature of this war? We started our thoughts last Sunday, and today I want to give you five basic principles to understand about our enemy forces so that we can be better educated to win this war. Here's the first one. You might want to write this down. The war against darkness has been declared by the Lord. We start here, and it's very important to start here. We are in a war. We, we didn't start this war. We didn't declare this war. The conflict between the kingdom of light and the dominion of darkness goes back farther than man does. The conflict was going on before man even knew about it. Adam and Eve were not aware of the war going on until after they sinned, until after they were seduced. You see, from man's perspective, the mother of all battles was declared at the fall, but it was actually going on before then. Remember, after they sinned and God rounded them up, he spoke to the man, he spoke to the woman, 
And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, he spoke to the serpent and he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now God is saying we are going to be at War. God announces his intention to launch a counteroffensive. God says, I'm not going to sit back and watch you damn my creation and do nothing about that. I'm going to launch a counteroffensive to crush you. And that D Day was Bethlehem. Jesus went behind enemy lines to turn the tide of the war. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, the latter part of verse 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Typically, when you and I read the Gospels, I think that we imagine that Jesus is on the earth and the devil is pursuing Jesus. I would like to suggest in the future when you read the Gospels, you read it the other way around. The Bible says that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. To meet the devil. You remember the story where they're on the lake, they're crossing the lake, and they, they come up to the shore where there's this man in this cemetery. He's naked, he's been screaming, he's filled with demons. Would you have stepped off that boat? Jesus didn't say, uh, no, take the boat down farther shore. Jesus did not run away from the devil. He stepped off of that boat. Because he came to meet the devil and destroy his work. So we need to understand the decision of whether or not we will be battling the hosts of hell has already been made by God. We are the army of God. Jesus Christ is our commanding officer. The Bible is our manual and our sword. And the whole earth is our battlefield. And we're not talking about, are we soldiers today? We are talking about, what kind of soldiers are we? Because the war against darkness has been declared by the Lord. The second principle is very important as well, and it is the future of darkness has been decided at the cross. Our commanding officer has already won the battle that ensures final victory. You see... If you are a student of warfare, you know that in war, there is often a battle that decides the, the, con, uh, the, the, the major points of, of the war, the future of the war. There's, there's a critical battle that, that determines the tide of the war. Once the forces landed at Normandy and began to move into France, Hitler's reign was over. The war wasn't over. But the battle, the war had already been decided at that point. There is in war a, a battle, sometimes a, a series of battles that determine the outcome before the war is actually over. And that's what happened in this war. The death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ delivered a blow to the hosts of hell from which they will not be able to recover. You see, if Christ hadn't come, we would be casualties of war. Because there was an indictment lodged against us that said we are sinners. And the book says the wages of sin is death. And death in the Bible means separation from God. We were all doomed to be casualties of war, but something happened. There was a battle just outside the ancient city of Jerusalem, and it changed everything. It says in Scripture, in Colossians chapter 2, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And listen, having dis armed the powers and authorities he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross what that means is that satan's best weapon has been deactivated by jesus every single james bond movie has the exact same plot line there is an evil person and he's got a weapon and he's gonna either overtake the world or destroy the world. 
And James Bond has to get across enemy lines and deactivate the weapon before the evil boss does this thing. That's the plot of every James Bond movie that's ever been made. And you don't have to see any of them anymore. You know what the whole story is. <laughs> the Bible says that is exactly what Jesus did. He dis armed the other side. The other side pretends that it has weapons, but the truth is the chief weapon of the other side was death. We were sinners, and the sin issue got dealt with at the cross, and we don't have to be separated from God anymore. Satan is just a bluffer now. He's worse than Barney Fife. At least Barney has one bullet for his weapon. <laughs> Satan doesn't have any ammo anymore. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So we have got to remember that Jesus deactivated Satan's best weapon. And what that means is that we are not fighting for victory anymore. We are fighting from victory. I know the battle gets long. I know that evil is all around us. But we have got to keep that truth close to our hearts that we are fighting from victory. The outcome of the war has already been decided. I'll give you an illustration from the scriptures. In Joshua chapter 6, we have the great story of the children of Israel walking around the walls of Jericho and, and the walls falling down. We remember that story. But you go back to the very start of that story in that chapter and Joshua was out there looking and he doesn't even have any idea what it is that he is supposed to do. The children of Israel had never actually seen a walled city before. They've, they've been out in the desert for 40 years. They, they don't have the resources that they need to take down a city or a city wall. So what are they going to do? And the Lord comes to Joshua and the Lord says to him, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. And every time I read that, I think if I was Joshua hearing from God, I would say, see what? I don't see it. I see a big city. I see big walls. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. But God was saying to Joshua, can you see by faith that I have already given you victory here, Joshua? I can speak with such certainty that I can speak like it's already happened. And Joshua the scripture says, believed by faith in the Lord, and he received the victory. Now that's how God tells you and me to live. And, and it might seem like it's dark right now, and the battle's still going, but the war has been decided. And you've been called by God to fight like that. You fight from victory. We war against Satan only to maintain and consolidate the victory that Jesus Christ has already attained for us. Now, does that, does that mean that Satan is going to give up? Well, that's principle number three. The enemies of darkness will be determined till the end. Satan has been thoroughly defeated, but he has not yet been executed. I want you to read a passage with me from Revelation. My wife uh, jumped into this. I didn't know she was even going to do that. From Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 7, John the Revelator wrote these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He said, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. 
Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. Now, what that means is that God is no longer within the reach of Satan, but he still hates God and he has to vent his hatred against God by trying to hurt God's children. It's not because he thinks he can win the war. It's just pure malice and hate and spite. Back in the Gulf War, when the Iraqis were driven out of Kuwait, one of the things that they did was they set fire all of the oil wells as they left that region. Now, they did not do that as a part of their strategic war plan. They did not do that to slow down their enemies who were pursuing them. They did not give them a, a better chance at winning the war later. It was simply pure spite and hate. It was an attitude that said, well, maybe we are going to lose this war, but we're going to cause all the havoc and destruction that we possibly can. And that is the devil. He knows that his time is short and he's going to make it as ugly and awful as he possibly can before the end. And you need to know, he is double-faced, but he is not double-minded. He does not get distracted. He never will surrender. He will literally fight till the death. Even though the war cannot be lost, battles can be. And they are every single day. If you were to ask me about our church, I, I, would, I would tell you this. I see evidence every single day that the power of Jesus Christ is real. But I also see evidence every single day that Satan never lets up. The war is won. But battles are still in question. We have to report for duty, stand strong in the victory of Jesus Christ. We need to compel the devil's retreat, which he has no longer a right to own anything. And by the way, he will retreat when he knows he cannot win. That leads us to our fourth point, and that is this. The tactics of darkness can be defensed by the believer. Now notice I say, by the believer. I find absolutely no evidence in the Bible that there is any possibility for victory against Satan and the hosts of hell if you are not born again. I find no reason in all of the Bible to believe that if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you have any defense against the devil. But if you do, if you are a Christian, then you are like David. Now, David went down to fight a giant, and David was honest about that giant's resources. He said, you come to me with armor, and you come to me with sword and spear and stature. You come to me with an impressive armory. David admitted the reality that Goliath was very strong. But then he said, but let me tell you something, giant. I come to you in the name of a greater reality. I come to you in the name of the God who is the leader of the armies of Israel. And I want to tell you something about Satan. He is a coward at heart. He does not stay and fight if he knows he's about to take a whipping. Now, don't misunderstand me. He doesn't stay away. He'll watch and he will come back as soon as he sees that your guard is down. But if he knows he's going to lose... He runs. You see, you have position in Christ, a fortress that he cannot conquer 
We just have not learned how to stand strong in our position. We've got formidable weapons to use. We're going to talk about that in the weeks ahead. We've got the name of Jesus. It's the name that's above every single name. We've got the blood of Christ. The scriptures that we read say that they overcame him by the blood. Satan has no weapon that can penetrate the blood. We've got the power of the Holy Spirit. We've got the word of God, which exposes him his lies, and they are his chief weapon. We've got formidable weapons. That's why the Bible says to us in James chapter 4, the latter part of verse 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. We've got it backwards. We tend to think that we've got to run away from the devil, but the Bible says stand strong in your armor and the devil will run from you. Decline and defeat are not the norm for the people of God. We are overcomers in Jesus. We can turn back the dark side. In fact, not only can we defense the attacks of hell, we can go on the offense and drive hell back. That's our last point. The captives of darkness must be delivered through the church. One of the critical battles of the Civil War was the Battle of Shiloh. There was a Union regiment that was supposed to take a hill, and the commanding officer told his drummer to sound out attack. Back in those days, messages would go out to the troops by different drum beats. So he beats out attack. And the Union forces start to go up that hill and they, they come into contact with serious fire from a superior position and the officer quickly yelled out, Sound out retreat! The boy picked up his drum and he sounds out attack. The officer yelled, I told you to do retreat! And he said, Well, they never taught me retreat. They only taught me attack. <laughs> and the Union forces heard that sounding of attack and went up that hill in the Battle of Shiloh and conquered that hill. Now as I read our manual that we were given at boot camp, I don't read where we were given orders to retreat. I read where we were commissioned by our commanding officer to charge. Jesus told Peter, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Gates are a defensive weapon. Jesus' vision for his church would be that it would be aggressive, that it would be militant, that it would be on the move, that it would go and knock down the defensive posture of hell to keep it from advancing into all the world. That is God's will. Those are our orders. We are to pray for God's kingdom and for God's rule to come, but that cannot happen until Satan's kingdom is put down. And we don't do that kind of fighting through a bunch of personal, little, individual, petty battles. We do that corporately. Christ manifest His authority through His church as we take on the gates of hell. I want you to understand that we have been ordered to take the battle to the enemy. And since the enemy is the prince of this world, our orders are to go into all the world. Paul was commissioned this way by, by Jesus in Acts chapter 26. Look at Jesus' words to Paul. He says, I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. We are on a search and rescue mission. The war is already decided. The God of heaven has won, but the war is not over, and the enemy has a lot of captives that still need to be rescued. And any soldier knows that a search and rescue mission has incredible risks involved. Our commanding officer knew there would be risks when he gave us our orders. Stu Weber 
was a former Green Beret who became a pastor, a pastor of a well-known church in Oregon, Good Shepherd Community Church. He pastored that church for almost 40 years. He's retired just a few years back. He also wrote a number of books. He's a very accomplished author. And in one of his books, he shared a story about going home to visit his father in a town, a little town called Clee Ellum, which is right in the heart of the Cascade Mountains in the state of Washington. Well, his dad asked him to get in the pickup truck. So Stu drove the truck and he took his son to a little cemetery. And they went to a grave site. And the stone they visited said Doug Monroe C-M-O-H. And some of you know that stands for Congressional Medal of Honor. And his dad wanted Stu to hear the story of Doug. He said, Doug was my best friend growing up. In fact, when Doug was drafted, he asked if I would take his girlfriend to prom and be her escort. But Doug never came back, never saw his girlfriend again, never got married, never had kids. Doug died September 27, 1942, in a faraway place, a little island in the Pacific that nobody in Clee Ellum had ever heard of, a place called Guadalcanal. The Marines had stormed the beach, and they had over 500 men pinned down by Japanese forces. They were being massacred. They were stuck on that beach, and they were about to be slaughtered. Doug commandeered five Higgins boats, just flat wooden bottom boats, and he took them straight into enemy fire. He told the four boats to go and let the Marines climb on board. He took his boat and went up and down that beach with a machine gun in arm, firing at the enemy as he drove that boat back and forth. He used his boat as a shield while the other boats were being loaded with the men stuck on that beach. When he got hit, he kept driving and firing his gun like Rambo. He got hit again. He kept driving the boat firing his gun. He got hit again. He couldn't fire the gun, but he kept driving the boat. And finally, he stayed at his post to the point where all of the Marines that were pinned down on that beach got off of that beach, and then he collapsed. And his buddy said his last words were this, did we get them all? And they say, yes, we did. And with a smile on his face, he died. But why would a man do something like that? Why would you give up your future, your, your body, your, your plans? I suppose only if you believe there was a cause bigger than yourself. Only if you believe that there were some things in life more important than your own life. When Jesus recruited you, he told you right up front, you come follow me. And if you will lose your life for me, you will have it. But if you spend your life trying to protect your life, you will lose it. And you know what he did next? Jesus went and gave up his life for you and for me. Folks, I want to please that kind of commanding officer. I think it's significant that the very last picture we have of Jesus in the Bible is in the book of Revelation as a warrior. He is on a war horse. It says his eyes are like fire and he has a, a sword coming out of his mouth. And there is a big army right behind him. And it says in Revelation that he comes to make war. The last picture that we have in all of the Bible of Jesus is the commander in chief who is coming to end everything. And I want to tell you something. There is only one war to end all wars. And you need to make sure that you are on the right side. We're going to sing a song of invitation this morning. If you've got a decision to make, I want to encourage you to make that decision public as we stand up and get ready to sing together.